this. Bada bing, bada boom. You ready? We Why are. Psalm 45 cannot be about a mere human king? And by the way, I may have to go. Yeah, I may end up just doing Psalm 45. It's too much meat. Psalm 45 was actually used by the early Christian writers. Let me give you a little history about early church. The writings of the Christians, let's say of the first five centuries, 400 years, let's say even the fifth century, 400 years will include Augustine, right? Are broken down in various categories. And another important feature to note is that not every writer was considered a church father. Meaning you had individuals who highly influenced the church by their writings and their arguments and apologetics. In fact, in my opinion, one of the best defenders of the Trinity and one of the best polemicists destroying modalism. People don't know this. Albie knows this because he's dealt with modalists. Around the middle to the latter part of the second century, middle, latter part, second century, there was a group that believed that the father became Jesus and the father suffered and died on the cross. They were called modalists. And you had outstanding Christians demolishing their arguments, destroying their arguments, one of whom was Tertullian. Now, Tertullian is not a church father. I know there have been people who sometimes mistakenly call them a father because it's easy to do that because Tertullian ended up following a man named Montanus, Montanus, who claimed that the Holy Spirit Paraclete was giving him new revelations. And I don't know why Tertullian got caught up with that movement. He became a Montanist, but they were still Trinitarians. They did not deny the Trinity. That's why Tertullian is loved and respected, and that's why his writings are appealed to to show he was a Trinitarian. Do not let these heretics, tools of the devil, say otherwise. I've seen people like Mormons trying to say it wasn't. They're lying. Just like they butcher scripture, they butcher these men. And I've done sessions, I have articles proving otherwise. He is one of the best defenders of the Trinity, and he demolishes a man named Sibelius, who taught that the Father became Jesus and suffered. And this heresy was called Patri Passionism. Patri Passionism. Patri Pater. And passion meaning the father suffered. And you know how he demolished them? Do you know how he demolished them? Brother, do you know one of the ways he demolished modalism? How, how's that? Using the Old Testament to show there are at least two distinct persons identified as Yahweh God. That's how he demolished them. He goes, if, you're, if what you say is true, that... The father becomes Jesus, and there was no son in the Old Testament. Then how do you explain these? And he would quote Psalm 45. Hmm. And he would quote Psalm 110. And he would quote Psalm 2. And he would quote Genesis 19.24. They quoted the same verses. We quote today to show a divine plurality in the Old Testament. And he would appeal to the angel of the Lord. Not only he did that. Justin Martyr did that. And there were others who demolished. I'm sorry. He responded to Praxius, not Sibelius. My apologies. Guys, the Lord correct all my mistakes and errors on the spot. He wrote against Praxius, not Sibelius. Praxius was a modalist. He believed that the Father became Jesus. In my article, I quote his destruction of Praxius. And you'll be blown away. And how much Old Testament he quotes to show that already in the Old Testament, you have proof there's more than one person who is God. I'll show you the article. See? See how amazing they were? So if you go to my blog, you use the search engine, Tertullian. Tertullian, you put Trinity. Tertullian and the Doctrine of the Trinity. And his writings are online for free. And he demolishes Praxis by quoting Genesis 19, 24, Psalm 45, Psalm 110, and on and on it goes to show already in the Old Testament, already in the Old Testament, see, he's refuting Praxis, you have more than one divine person showing that Praxis is a heretic and a Bible butcher. Go see, and you go see what he quotes. And he shows that the person of the Son was there before creation. Look what he says. 
by unity of substance, while the mystery of dispensation is still guarded, which distributes unity into a trinity, placing in their order the three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Yeah, that's an English translation. <clears throat> Holy Ghost meant Holy Spirit. Three hour, not in condition, but in degree. Not in substance, but in form. <clears throat> not in power, but in aspect, because their power is one. Yet of one substance, and of one condition, of one power, and as much as he is one God, from whom these degrees and forms and aspects are reckoned, on the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And he goes on and on and on to show. From the Old Testament, Son is not the Father, Father did not become Jesus, and the Trinity lives, right? Now, why do I mention it? Because do you know that one of the texts they use, one of the texts they use to prove that the Father begot the Son is Psalm 45? You guys aware of that? And let me get you to think. Because people are like, hey, well, you just to put Tertullian in the Trinity. It's there. <clears throat> One of the texts they use is Psalm 45. Tertullian used others to show that Psalm 45 speaks of the begetting of the Son. The begetting of the Son. So I'm going to have to start with that. Can we start with that? Perfect. What's the feedback <clears throat> on your end? <clears throat> Feedback with us besides people trying to distract and getting muted. No, I'm sorry. Yeah, they get muted. They're, they're, they're dogs. Now, what's beautiful, this section here, he actually argues before creation, the logos of God, which is his reason existing within him, whom he summoned forth. And when he summoned forth, he came out of him without separating from him. And that act of summoning him forth is when the son was begotten. But he says already before that act, that Logos in God was a distinct person from the Father, whom the Father was communicating with. Hmm. So yet even not then was he alone, for he had with him that which he possessed in himself. And he goes on a huge explanation of how you, when you reason with, within yourself and you talk to yourself, it's as if there's a second person. But he says that's simply an analogy because it's not a second person in you. But even though it's not a second person in you, it is a second person in God. Brilliant, brilliant exegesis. Brilliant. But sadly, he's not a church father because he followed Montanus. Neither is Origen a church father. Let me give a little history. Origen. Guys, uh, get the material. Just go to my blog, put Tertullian. Trinity, it's right there. Read all of it. Justin Martyr, read all of it. Irenaeus, Origen was considered one of the most brilliant Christian writers. And he wrote, they say, thousands of books. He actually had six editions of the Old Testament called the Hexapla. 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 Now, what is that? The six editions of the Hexapla. Or the six editions called the Hexapla, meaning six. He took the Hebrew Old Testament. He studied Hebrew. And then he translated the Hebrew Old Testament with Greek letters. And then he also included the translation of the 70 Septuagint. And then he included the translations of Semachus, Aquila, Aquila, and Theodosian. You may not know this. In the second century after Christ, you had two proselytes, two converts to Judaism, and another individual... Three individuals called Theodosius, Theodosian, Aquila, pronounced Aquila by some, right? Samachos, who translated the Old Testament into Greek, Greek to compete with the translation of the 70 that was done before the time of Christ. So he took the four Greek versions of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, translation 70, Samachos, Theodosian, Aquila, combined them in one volume with the Hebrew Old Testament and the Greek translation of the Hebrew called the Hexapla. The man was brilliant. He knew languages. But the reason why he's not considered a father, he tried to marry, he tried to combine Neoplatonic thinking, the views of Greek philosophers that heavily influenced him with Christianity, and he came up with a monster. For example, he actually believed in pre-existence of souls, that all of us, our souls, pre-existed. He also believed 
that there were levels of deity, gradations of deity. So the father was a greater God than the son, and the son was a greater God than the Holy Spirit, and yet he believed all three of them are uncreated. They had no beginning. So he believed in pre-existence of souls because that's Neoplatonic thinking, you know, the realm of ideals and forms and so on. And he tried to sandwich that with Christianity. So he came up with a convoluted, garbled form of Christianity. And then another thing he taught that I learned from Bart Ehrman. A lot of people don't know this about Bart Ehrman. Bart Ehrman is a scholar of the Greek New Testament, and he's a scholar of the Greek writers. The early Christian writers, second, third, fourth centuries, he reads them in Greek. And he's actually published some of their writings in Greek and translated them. Bart Ehrman is a bona fide scholar of Greek. And he knows church history. Sadly, though, his biased views skew his interpretation of the data like it does with the Bible. But I learned this from him in his book, How Jesus Became God. He has a section on the second, third, fourth century Christian writers. And he mentions their views about the Trinity and the deity of Christ. And he mentions that Origen believed this. Watch this. Because remember, Origen being influenced by Plotinus, Plato, Aristotle, all these Greeks. You have the realm of ideals, right? Forms and so on. He believed that we pre-existed as souls. Okay? That before I became flesh, I already existed as a soul. So he believed that the human Jesus' soul pre-existed. And... According to Bart Ehrman's reading of Origin, the Logos saw this one soul and was so drawn to that soul because of its purity that he attached that soul to himself and made that soul inseparable from himself. Well, that's a form of Nestorianism. So Origin, though died still in union with the church, is condemned as a heretic because of these views. Everyone got it before I move on? Got it. You understand what he believed? Because he believed in the pre-existence of souls, that all of us before we became flesh were there as souls and then sent into flesh bodies. So the human Jesus, his soul pre-existed. And so the Logos saw this soul and was so drawn to the purity and sinlessness of soul, he made that soul inseparably one with himself. And I learned that from Bart Ehrman. <laughs> like, wow, that's what he, that's Nestorianism, Eastern Orthodox. That is Nestorianism. And Origen also held the view that at the end, and they say that he learned this from his instructor, his bishop. And the name of his bishop slips my mind. Origen, Alexandria, Egypt, so he's African. Uh, I believe it was his instructor was, is it Cyril of Alexandria? No, no, that's, I'm sorry, Cyril's later. My apologies. Don't quote me there. I'm trying to remember the name of his instructor. One of you guys can remember. Anyway, he actually held out. He actually held out the belief that at the end, God would save everyone out of hell, even Satan. He actually believed in what's called universalism. That those who go to hell are not there to be tormented eternally or wiped out of existence. It's more like punishment with the aims of correcting them, remedying them, and transforming them so they can dwell with God forever. So he held out the belief that even Satan would be restored. Now, for those of listening, you see why we can't just jump into the topic? We have to break stuff down. But I hope you're learning, and I pray the Spirit will correct all my errors and destroy all our sins. Are they getting it? With you. What's the reaction of the people hearing this? Yeah, some of them are, are shocked, absolutely. So when you hear Origen, Tertullian, they're not church fathers. They're church writers and heavily influential. Now, if you want to learn more about Origen, this is what you're going to do. You're going to go to my blog again and search engine. You're going to go boom. You put in Origen. There you go. Oh, Origen. Hold on. Boom. You go here and Origen on Isaiah 53. Origin dialogue with Heraclitus. This has to do with the Trinity. I'm going to show you what he says about it. And then you go here, click on boom, older posts, and keep going, keep going, go down, boom, older posts, bam. 
that's what you do. When you get to the bottom of the page, it doesn't mean you're at the end. Click older posts. Now, let me show you what Origin says about the Father and the Son. Right here. Let me show you real quick. And then I link to one older article that I wrote for AnsweringIslam.info. Origin dialogue with Heraclides. 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 Okay. So you go down here, though, and I link. Well, I didn't link here. Man, I'm stupid. What happened? To me? Okay. Okay, so I didn't link on there. All right. Sorry, guys. I thought I linked here. I. Oh, yeah. I No, I don't. Can you forgive me for being dumb? Let me get you the article that I, I linked to Origin elsewhere, but I thought I linked here. See, sometimes I don't link. So when you go here, answeringislam.info, you're going to click here, my article section. Let me get you the section of my articles here so you can pass it on. This is all necessary. That's why we do one, not only one part. You want information, right? You want to learn and go in depth. I got to do this. So don't say, Sam, you're boring, Sam. You're boring as bit, Sam. You suck, Sam. Well, I know I'm boring and I suck. Okay. And right here. And we're here. That's right. Okay. Now here's the article right here. So that's where you're going to find my articles. And then you're going to find origin. So you do command F if you have a Mac, put in O R I G. There's origins Christology. Because the Muslims were quoting him to show that he believed Christ is a creature and the spirit was created by Christ. So what I had to do was go and find books and quote the experts, scholars on origin. And I found them. And I quote them quoting origin and explaining what he believed. And they document from what origin wrote that he did not say the sun was created. So he wasn't the forerunner to areas, nor did he say the spirit was created. He believed they were uncreated, but the Father was a greater God than the Son, and the Son was a greater God than the Spirit. So he believed there were gradations in the divinity. So in some sense, the Father was a greater God, more God than the Son, but the Son is God, as is the Spirit. So right here. So if you don't mind reading to learn what he taught, so you don't be misled and deceived, this is what I did. I didn't go by what people told me. I went and examined. And I saw I was being lied to and misled. Right? So there you go. That's the article. So let me get it to you. All right. So here it is. But I'm going to show you what he says to Heraclides. Heraclides. Let me show you what he says to him. You ready? Mm -hmm. It's going to confuse some of you. Because even Muslims have jumped on the bandwagon. Is that his best, uh, Bishop Jose? Jose, go to Google, put in origin, universalism, and then the bishop that taught him. I thought the bishop was either Clement of Alexandria. I think his bishop was Clement, who taught universal. I think. Don't, uh, don't quote me. Now watch what he says to Heraclides. Heraclides. I like these Greek names. You ready, guys? He's, he's having a discussion. Okay, origins dialogue with a bishop. He's dialing with a bishop, right? Look what he says about the Trinity. So look, I say introduction. The following is an excerpt from origins dialogue with a bishop, which further confirms that he was a Trinitarian who believed in the consubstantiality of the Father and the Son. Origin also affirmed the physical bodily resurrection of our Savior, condemning as heresy the denial that our Lord's resurrection was physical, bodily in nature. All right, so boom. Look what he says. I also believe that the sacred, what the sacred scripture says, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning of God. All things were made by him. Without him, nothing was made. Accordingly, we hold the same faith that is taught in these words. We believe that Christ took flesh, that he was born, that he went up to heaven in the flesh, which he rose again. Now, what Origen says in his commentary, his commentary on John 1 is not so straightforward. He says in John 1 that when it says... The word was with God. The word was with God. Right? Screen share. Did I lose the article? What did I do with the article? Do you know? Because I'm a special kind of dummy. <laughs> when he says the word was with God, let me click on it again. It says there, it says he is with O Theos, the definite article, Tan Theon, the God. But then it says when the word was God, 
It doesn't use the article. He says, because the word is God by participation in the divinity of the Father. So the Father is God of himself, but the Son is God by participation in the divine nature of the Father. Right? So everyone got it here? Did I, did I do something? Did I lose the channel? I, I confused myself. Sorry. All right. So everyone got it there? With you. Okay. Let me just read some more stuff because here I want to see your reaction. I want to see people's reaction here. And I gave you the wrong article. Yeah, and yet of all the early fathers, he's the he quoted of the four Gospels most out of any, anybody else over 9,000 times. S sucks being you, dude. Yeah. I to tell you that. All right, here. Let me go here. This is the article. All right. Sorry, guys. I, I somehow X out something. But here, let's go there. Okay. Okay, you guys ready? They're ready? Tell me if they're ready. We're ready. All right. Let's read. How many gods are they? Watch here. I'm going to go to the bold part. Christ, the origin, is telling the bishop, Christ Jesus, who is in the form of God, being other than the God in whose form he exists, meaning he's not God the Father. So if he's in the form of God, he's in the form of God the Father, but he's not God the Father. Was he God before he came into the body or not? So he's asking the bishop. He was God before. Was he God before he came into the body or not? Yes, he was. So he makes him repeat it. Was he God distinct from this God in whose form he existed? Obviously, he was distinct from another being. And since he was in the form of him, create all things, he was distinct from him. Is it true? So he's testing the bishop to see if he sound, right? Is it true then that there was a God, the Son of God, the only begotten of God, the firstborn of all creation, and that we need have no fear of saying that in one sense, there are two gods, while in another sense, there is one God? Damn! You guys hear it? So in a way, we can say there are two gods to show they're not the same person. But in another way, we say they're one God because in reality, their nature is one. Because the Father's nature is the Son's nature. Leroy, I'm about to bust you up, man. Okay? It's big enough, you blind little bat. Go get you glasses. Did you hear it? <laughs> Did everyone see it? Yep. How do they react to that? And now look what, go ahead, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I know, uh, positively. TikTok can't see it, unfortunately. Sorry. Damn, Gina's right, buddy. Now watch what the bishop responds. Yet what you say is evident. Yep. In one way, we say they're two gods, so they're, we don't say they're the same person. But another way, we say one God because their nature is one. But we affirm that God is the Almighty, God without beginning, without end, containing all things and not contained by anything, and that his word is the son of the living God, God and man, who didn't stop being God. You get it? He was God when he became man, through whom all things were made, God according to the spirit, man as much he was born of Mary. So then again, is the son distinct from the father? Of course. How can he be son if he is also father? While being distinct from the father, is the son himself also God? He himself is also God. And do two gods become a unity? Yes. Do we confess two gods? Yes, the power is one. See it? Mm -hmm. You can go read it. Anyway, he explains to you why we say there are two gods, but they're one. He uses the example of Adam and Eve. All right? But you get it, right? So you'll see. What he's trying to say for you, those of you who seem scandalized, this is what he's trying to say. He's trying to say that we can say there are two gods, so people don't think, Jesus is the same person as the Father. But at the same time, we must say they're one God so that people don't think the Father's nature and the Son's nature are two different natures because the Father's nature is the Son's nature, the Spirit's nature. Their power is one. Their nature is one. So their Godhead is one. Mm. This is why if you don't read them in their context and you don't let them explain what they mean, but you read back your understanding, you're going to misrepresent them, butcher their statements, and make them seem less orthodox. <clears throat> so he explains it there. Now, why I mention origin? Because he's not a church father. If you hear someone saying he's a church father, either that's a slip of the tongue or it's a heretic who's lying about origin. Because I've heard people 
who are not Trinitarians, who don't know church history, will say, Tertullian, the church father. He's not a church father. Origin, he's not a church father. But I've heard people who do know about church history who make a mistake. Slip of the tongue will say church father. Because sometimes we speak too fast, and sometimes we speak off the cuff, and we make mistakes. Not everyone can be as perfect as me or as infallible as me. So take it easy. You with me there? I'm with you. All right. So take it easy, guys. So now let's go to Psalm 45. First, let's show how Psalm 45 affirms the beginning of the sun. Are you ready, mister? Ready. This is all to what your appetites. So if you want to do a part two, part three, because we're not going to finish all this. In yeah. Each, each psalm should be a part in, in itself. I think that's a great right. idea. You're a good man. Honestly, the rumors about you are not true. <laughs> all right. So. Let's go about the begetting of the sun. I'm going to get the article for you because we're going to start there. Believe it or not, Christian writers like Tertullian and fathers cited Psalm 45 as another proof text for the sun's being begotten. Why? You don't see it. You don't see it in your English translation. You don't see it in your English translation, which is sad. Let me see if I can find it. Psalm 45. Let me see. Hold on. Oh, yeah. I got to do told. Because you see, here's the problem with modern Hebrew. Modern Hebrew, instead of saying, for example, Dawid, they'll say David. Instead of Wa, they'll say Vav. So I'm always having to make sure. Here it is. This is it. I got it here. It's in the description box. You ready? You ready, dude? Ready. All right. Do you need the link to this article? Please. Do you need me also make breakfast for you? <laughs> I don't mind. There you go, guys. Here's the link for you guys here. Here's the link for everyone else. Oh, what day is it? Ba -la 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 -la. And here it is for you. You and me, all of the people. Watch here, guys. The beginning of the sun. And you'll be shocked. You're going to say, are you kidding me? All right. Let's go to the beginning of the sun. All right. You ready here? Let me first go to the word itself. Uh, why did they make it hard for me, dude? Here it is. You ready? Okay. Ready. My heart is stirred with a good word. My heart is stirred with a good word. Rachash, Rachash, Libbi, Dabar, Tob. Dabar is the word for word. Davar, Tob, Tob means good. Word that is good. Libby, my heart. Lib, lip, right? Or lev. So I stirred up a good word out of my heart. You see it here? I speak my verses to the king. According to Hebrews, you know who's speaking here? It's not the psalmist who's speaking. It's God the Father speaking, using the mouth of the psalmist and his pen. It is God speaking. It is God who says here, my heart has stirred up a good word. The bad word, that is good, stirred up from my heart. Now, believe it or not, this was taken to refer to the begetting of the son. That the son was begun from the bosom, the heart of the father. Now, if you go to some, now this is Psalm 45, but in the Greek it's Psalm 44. So let me go to Psalm 44. Now watch the psalm in Greek. You ready? Ready. My heart is stirred with a good word, right? Rachash libbi. You know what libbi is. You speak a Syrian, dude. What's libbi? My heart. Right? It's like saying, libbi, 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 you. You know not sing that, right? I can Fat guess. Fat and shab. You guys, if you don't know, in a Syrian culture, we have a lot of Syrian singers. A famous Assyrian singer is a woman named Fatin Shabu. So she would sing, Libby, Libby, my heart, my heart. Libby, 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 you. I mean, my heart is on you. My heart is yours. Right? She sang one of my favorite songs. See, these are, these are Assyrian love songs. The song is, my eyes always on your path. I always get up in the morning to see you walk to school, hoping you see me and give me a wink. Because in the old days, 
If a guy was caught going out with an Assyrian girl, he'd be shish kebab. That's the old days. The old days, you couldn't go out with a girl. You'd have to just tell her you're interested. And she goes, all right, well, come and tell my father and ask my brothers. Right? <laughs> Those days are gone. Now a Assyrian woman ask you out. Right? They come and say, hey, big boy, I want to go out with you. What about <laughs> your father or brother? Don't worry about it. You, you know what I'm talking about, right? Hater? Wow. Hater. Yeah, yeah, what a day and age we live in, man. In my days, in the 80s, brother, I think you were still in diapers back then, but in the 80s, <laughs> you could not dare be seen with an Assyrian girl in public because her whole family, the fathers, the uncles, the brothers, the cousins, they'd even fly from Iraq to come and find you and shish kebab you. Yep, that's how it was. Anyway, so Libby. But now watch the Greek, guys. Are you ready? This is the Greek. For the end, for alternate strains by the sons of Korah, for instruction, a song concerning the beloved. It's a song about who? The beloved. To agape to. It's about the beloved. The one whom the speaker loves. I'm going to show you how this phraseology is of Jesus and why the early church saw this is the father speaking about his love for the son and begetting the son. Why? Because Hebrews 1 quotes it about the son. You see how brilliant these early Christian writers were and these church fathers were? They didn't have Lagos. They didn't have a court. They didn't have internet. They couldn't carry the Bible in two volumes, but they studied the Bible with such passion and understood the scriptures with such passion and believed in their heart that Jesus was all over the Old Testament. They found Jesus everywhere. They found Jesus everywhere. And they read in Greek, whoa, whoa wait, wait, wait. Psalm 45 is quoted in Hebrews 1 about our Lord Jesus. So let's go to Psalm 45, which in the Greek, Psalm 44. Oh, wow. To agape to. One of the titles of our Lord. But then watch here. My heart is uttered a good word. Ech or ex iri u. Ah, you Greeks. Zatu he cardia. That's the word for heart, like cardiac arrest. Mu logon agathon. Logos. Logon. Logos. Word that is good. I declare my works to the king. My tongue is the pen of a quick writer. So I say the reason why this psalm readily lends itself in support of Christ's eternal beginning is because it not only mentions the word, the bar logos, title ascribed to the Son. He is the word. In the beginning was the word. The word was God, right? The word was God. Not only that, the word became flesh, right? Here you go. <clears throat> but also because the psalm is specifically just to the beloved, to agape to a term which the New Testament describes to Jesus as God's uniquely beloved son. You are my beloved son. O weusmu, o agapitus. There it is. O weusmu, o agapitus. He is the beloved. Hmm. And what does the psalm say in Greek? This psalm is to the beloved, to agapitu. And who's the beloved? My word, that is good, that came out of my heart. Well, where does Jesus dwell? Where does Jesus dwell? In the well, bosom of the Father. Amen. He what? In the bosom of the Father. Sorry, I thought you were asking me, Sam. No, no, no. It's okay. You can answer. That's fine. Because now let's see where he dwells. And notice, he is the beloved. You've loved me from before the foundation of the world. John 17, 13. 24, the beloved, right? Colossians 1, 13, the kingdom of his beloved son. To you, tis, agapis, autu. But notice, he is in the bosom of the father. The logos of the father who comes out of the bosom of the father. And what's in his bosom? His heart. This is why the voice translates it straight from the father's heart. Does anyone see the first connection? With Jesus? That's beautiful, Sam. Amen. That's not me. You know where I got it from? I didn't get I didn't know this until I read the early church. I got it from the church here. Tertullian. How do you think I discovered this? 
because of these amazing, <laughs> mind-blowing, holy martyrs, theologians, writers, and fathers of the church. When I read and I saw they're quoting Psalm 45, I'm like, why? <laughs> oh, I see why. Look, Tertullian. He believes that when God said, let there be light, that's when the word came out of his heart. Look what else he quotes. Okay. He quotes Proverbs 8.22. Look, they didn't have a cord. They didn't have blue letter Bible.com or Bible Gateway or Bible Hub. They didn't have the Bibles in between two covers. And yet from memory, as they're writing, they're citing verse after verse. Here, Genesis 1 3, Proverbs 8 22, Colossians 1 15. But now watch Psalm 45. And his only begotten also, because the lone begotten of God, in a way peculiar to himself, from the womb of his own heart, even as the Father himself testifies, my heart, says he, has emitted my most excellent word. He just quoted Psalm 45, verses 1 to 3. Can everyone get it before I move on? Absolutely amazing. But did you catch who said those words according to Tertullian? Not the psalmist. Not the psalmist. The psalmist was simply the mouthpiece and the pen. It was God the Father speaking. Hmm. It wasn't the hmm. psalmist. It was God the Father using the mouth of the psalmist to speak the words of the Father to the Son, and then he wrote it down by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In other words, if you agree with the early church, the entire Psalm 45 is about Jesus and it's not referring to any other Israelite king. So now my question to you Christians is this. Are you going to follow modern scholars? Are you going to follow even modern Catholic, Orthodox, Evangelical scholars who will disconnect with the early church and their understanding? Are you going to go with the early church that taught to a T, this is the Father speaking to the Son and no one else? Early church. But if you don't know the early church, you'll be easily swayed by modern scholarship that in comparison to the early church, they're jokes. They're a joke. Look at how many scripture he quotes. And where do, where do we get this from? And where does he address this? Against Praxius. He used Psalm 45 to show Praxius. You don't know what the hell you're talking about. Because the word was there in the Father. And then he was begun out of the Father's heart even before creation. See it? I want to, I want it to sink in. They, they all got it? Absolutely. What's the feedback on your end from TikTok, dude? It's beautiful. beautiful. Right, how about Cyprian? Watch here. That same Christ is the Word of God. Cyprian. What does he quote? In the 44th Psalm, which is Psalm 45 for us, my heart has breathed out a good word. I tell my works to the king. Also in the 32nd Psalm, by the word of God, that's Psalm 33, were the heavens made fast and all their strength of the breath of his mouth. Also in Isaiah, notice how much Bible he knows. He says, here's where you're going to find Jesus, Psalm 45. He is that good word that God emitted out of his heart. Psalm 33, 6, where it says, by the word of the Lord. Yahuwah, and the Greek word is logos, were the heavens made, and by the ruach, in Hebrew, pneuma, the spirit of his mouth. Psalm 33, 6 was used by the early church as a proof of the Trinity, because if you look at the Hebrew word for breath, Psalm 33, 6, it's ruach, spirit. And in Greek, it's pneuma. Literally, it's by the word of God, the word of Yahweh, and the spirit that came out of his mouth, did God make the heavens and the stars. Okay, sink it in? Yes, sir. All right. Now, so here, Cyprian quotes Psalm 45. And notice he also says Christ is the hand and arm of God. Look at how much Old Testament they know. He's saying, see, in the Old Testament, Christ is called the arm of God and the hand of God. In other words, we didn't invent this stuff. They knew it before we existed. So when we think we discover something, they're laughing at us. Ha ha, you morons. We already know this before you. Look. This is him. 1,700 years ago, before you and I existed, quoting Old Testament, he is the arm of the Lord. He is the hand of the Lord. He is the word of the Lord, the Lord God. 
What else is he? He's the angel of God, and he's called God. Right? We didn't come up with anything. They already knew it. Novation. Novation. And who is he refuting? Watch who he's refuting. Watch here. Treatise concerning the Trinity. Okay? Okay, now watch. What Old Testament text does he cite to show the Trinity? And that Jesus was already there as the eternal word who was begotten from the very heart, spiritual heart of the Father. Okay, well, he quotes Revelation 19, 13, right? That he is the word of God. His name is called the word of God, right? But now notice this part. And not without reason. My heart has emitted a good word. Hmm. Which word he subsequently calls by the name of the king. Inferentially, I will tell my works to the king. He just quoted Psalm 45. And then he combined it with John 1, 3. For by him were made all the works, and without him was nothing made. And on and on it goes. See? Everyone got it? For those of you guys on TikTok, you guys got to get this article. Either go to my YouTube or Sam's Rumble page. I posted it in the chat or Sam's Rumble page or simply go to Answering Islam, the <clears throat> blog, and uh, type, it in. type it in. Okay, so everyone got it, huh? There you go. Now, so what do we start it with? That Psalm 45 is God singing praises to his begotten son. It's not about any other king. So the question is, are you going to believe God? Well, of course, we all believe God. But more specifically, are you going to believe the early church's understanding that Psalm 45 has nothing to do, has nothing to do with any Israelite king. Any Israelite king. Sorry, I don't know why I went to my page here. Right? Sorry about that. I'm trying to go here. Let me see. I'm trying to find the article. Has nothing to do with any Israelite king. Talk about it's not safe anywhere anymore. I mean, seeing you is, is hard enough, brother. You with me there? <laughs> yes. Dude, what? These, uh, anyway, Lord have mercy. I'm trying to find the article. Sorry about that. Has nothing to do with any Israelite king. All right, let's go here. What day is it? La, 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 la. La, la, la. I'd send the description box, but anyway, I just want to Messiah Adonai. Here it goes. It has to do with the Messiah, the Son of God, right here. This is the article. Everyone with me there? With you. All right. Sorry, guys. I thought I was going to go back to my article, but I took you through a tour of TikTok and Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. And <laughs> this is like, right? Anyway, sorry about that. I, because I have too many pages open, I don't know what is what anymore. All right, but now we're here. So do you guys agree with the early church? Do you agree with the early church? Psalm 45 is not about Solomon. It's not about David. It's not about Hezekiah. It's God the Father glorifying his son, singing to his son, magnifying his son, identifying his son as the good word that came out of his heart. He begot him out of his bosom. The son whom he loves and he glorifies as the God, the Lord, who reigns forever, whom all will glorify and praise. Oof, give me chills, man. Amen. No, that's according to Hebrews 1. Hebrews 1 says, but about the son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever, right? <coughs> Amen. So here it is, the psalm. Let's read it. Psalm 45. And when this will be the end of this part. My heart is in indicting a good matter you see bad translation bad translation because remember the translators don't want to read too much trinity in the old testament meaning they want to go against the new testament understanding early church so they don't sound too biased because they want to appease modern scholarship the hell with modern scholarship the yeah, little translation I show what it is my heart has emitted a good word mm -hmm. davar logos Right? I showed you that. Right. That's a little translation. And I gave you the link to the article for that one. Now, with that said, this is now God the Father speaking. 
If you believe Hebrews, again, in case you don't believe Hebrews, but unto the Son, he saith, thy throne, O God. So Hebrews is telling you, and if you believe Hebrews is inspired by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit told the writer, Paul, God the Father speaking to his son here. Now, there are instances where God the Father will be speaking about David and Solomon, but then apply to the son because the promises given to them were not realized because they failed. That's a given. But here, from beginning then, it's about the word that the father emits out of his heart. That cannot be said about any human king. And I'll prove it. What else does it say that cannot be true of any human king? It's got to be the eternally begotten son who is one with the father, uncreated, of the same essence who became flesh. Why do I say it's got to be? Watch. I speak of the things which I have made touching the king. Of course, Jesus is the king, the son of the king. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. So meaning that the father will use his spiritual allegorical tongue and then the psalmist will write it down. You have me there? Absolutely. All right. Because the psalmist wrote it down for God. So he says to his son, gird thy sword upon thy thigh, O most mighty, Gibor. Well, if you know Isaiah 9, 6, one of the names of the child born who reigns on David's throne is Gibor. Il Gibor, God the mighty, with thy glory and thy majesty. And I've written an article where every description attributed to the king is attributed to Yahweh Almighty. Glory and majesty. But here's where it's going to get juicy. Thy throne, O God, Elohim, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is the right scepter. Thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness. Therefore, God, you God, your God, thy God, so your Elohim, and you have an Elohim over you. Well, how can he have an Elohim over him if he is God? Because he became flesh. Amen. He became flesh. Well, I got to go off camera because I got to get my cat. It became flesh. <laughs> yeah, I got it. Well, yeah, because my cat is out all day. All right, so became flesh. All right, so because it became flesh. Kitty, oh, kitty, 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 kitty. There, see, I knew it. There she is. Here, kitty. Come on in, kitty. Get inside, kitty. Come on, man. I think you own me like all the other women in my life. I think you own me, huh? Is that what you think? All right. Now, sorry. Sorry, guys, because of my cat. You know, my cat's more important than Albie. See, Albie can feed himself. My cat, who's going to feed her? Oh, kitty, 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 kitty. All right. Now, let's go here. So, thy throne, O God, is forever. So, you're the God who reigns forever. Your God, meaning I, God often speaks of himself in the third person, has anointed thee with the old gladness above thy fellows. Now, Hebrews tells us who these fellows are. Who are these fellows of his son? If you want to know the answer, it's Hebrews 2. You read 9 to 18. There we're told that the fellows of his son are redeemed believers, the physical descendants of Abraham, the physical believers, because there we're told that he's not ashamed to call us his brothers, sisters, he became flesh and blood in order to exalt us, glorify us, and restore to us the dominion that we lost. So his fellows are the redeemed humanity, redeemed human believers, males and females who, because of their love for Christ, have become the brothers and sisters of Christ, and therefore we are his companions, but he's still above us as our head. Hebrews 2, verses 9, 18, for the cross-reference, for the proof. Everyone got it? Absolutely. Bell Rock, you are a dog and a piece of garbage because Jesus is not the Father. And if you think you want, you can prove it. I'll give you the link so I can bury you in your fake God, you tool of the devil. Jesus is the Father, and you're your dog. If Jesus is the father, then you are your own female dog that you feed. Anyway, everyone with me there? Yeah. Now watch here. I like how you laugh. I don't know if it's just yeah, like a, trying to appease me. 
You better laugh from your heart, brother, because on day of judgment, you're going to be called to account if you're fake laughing. Be careful. Anyway, now, number one, he's called Elohim, right? Right. But now this other title, this is the title that's the knockout. Because the Unitarian heretics will tell you that the Messiah, who's merely human, is not called Adonai. He's called Adoni. Adonai is used for God, but it's never used for the human Messiah, Jesus. Here's their burial. Watch. Now, it's talking about the king and the queen. Now, in light of the New Testament, we know who the queen is. It's the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I give you all the evidence and the articles. So shall the king greatly desire thy beauty. Queen. Why? For he is thy Lord. And worship thou him. Now, the Greek word for worship is proskenio. The Hebrew is shacha yishtichava. It, it does mean worship, but not always. But how do I know it means worship him? The queen is called to worship the king because this word Adonai, if you see it here. Right. Ik means your. Ik meaning you, yours, right? Your what? Do you see the word here? It's your what? Your what? What's the word, dude? Sorry, I lost it. I'm trying to because it's a very small on my screen. It's oh my goodness, hold on, let me enlarge and worship it. thou him. Yeah, let me enlarge it, man. I thought it's big enough for YouTube. It's huge on my screen. What's the problem well, for, you, for YouTube? It's good. I'm on StreamYard and I'm looking at it. it's very small for my eyes. All right, well, all right. Do you see it now, Mister? Okay, ick. No, ick means your. Okay. Your what? But the man, man, I'm about to get the Muslims to know where you live. <laughs> Adonai ik ik means your, your what? Your Lord. Yeah, but what's the word? You see it, dude. Adonai. Yes, your Adonai. The king is called Adonai, and the queen has said, he's your Adonai. So much for that argument for the Unitarians. Did you catch it? Yeah. He's your Adonai. We got it? Beautiful. But here's where it's going to get more beautiful for you, mister. Not only is he your Adonai, therefore worship him, because that's what you do. You worship Adonai. <clears throat> now, this is now God speaking. I will make thy name to be remembered in all generations. Therefore shall the people praise thee forever and ever. Who is this king that not only is worshiped, He's called Adonai, and all peoples must praise him forever and ever. How in the world can this apply to any mere human king of Israel? <laughs> impossible. But now watch why it's impossible. Did you know the word Adonai, ik? it means ik Adonai, your Adonai, is only used one other time? Only one other time? So it okay. means you're only one other, you know where? No, I don't. Isaiah 51. 22. The word Adonai is used only one other time. It's used twice. Once for the king and the other time for Jehovah, Yahweh. And it's the same Isaiah 51 where Jehovah said to be your Elohim. Your Elohim, your Adonai. Same word. Thus saith thy Lord, Adonai, the Lord, Yahuwah, and thy God, thy Elohim. This word, Adonai, your Adonai, only used twice. Once for Yahweh, Jehovah, and the other time for the king. I want everyone to see that. Let it sink in. Yeah, it's absolutely amazing. Thus says your Lord, Yahweh, even your gods. And the God is Elohim. But that's what the king is called, Elohim and Adonai. And the word Adonai is used of him and for Yahweh. Here, let me show it to you. That's amazing. Who yeah. contends for his people. Behold, I have taken out of your hand a cup of reeling. Yeah. Now, goodness. let me show you the Hebrew, though. Watch here so people don't think I'm lying. There it goes. Blue letter Bible. Not blue letter. I'm sorry. Bible hub. Not Bible hub, dude. <laughs> yeah, Bible hub. What's wrong with me? It's Bible hub. So let me enlarge it. Internal uh, Bible hub. Watch Isaiah. It. Isaiah 51, 22, guys. Yes, Isaiah 51, 22. It's in my article. Now here, is the screen large enough for you? 
it's okay. Is, no. it, a, is, it, is it large enough or no? For for YouTube, it will be just for my stream. Here, man, on StreamYard stuff. Yeah, I, I got it. I got it. Go ahead. All right. Sir. Do you see what the word is here? Yes, it's Adonai. Same word, right? Same word. Say used of who? It's used of Yahweh. And he's called Wa. This is the Wa, but Eloheik, meaning your Elohim. Right. The word Adonai only appears twice. Here for Yahweh. Say 51, 22, and the other for the for the king. Here, now let's see what the word is in Psalm 45, 11. Here it is. Let's see. So people don't think I'm lying. That's why you just buried the Unitarians. Psalms 45, 11. Here it is. Okay. What's the word here? Adonai. Same word? Same word. Hmm. So how can Psalm 45 be about any mere human king, whether David or Solomon? Because that means David is Adonai. He is Elohim, or Solomon is Adonai Elohim. They will be praised forever and ever, and they are to be worshipped by the queen. I'm really, I'm praying everybody understands what Sam is saying here, because this is burial. It's done. It's done. You better believe it's done. You better believe it's done. Yeah, because Sam, I never. Uh, so this is good, man, because I'm learning this for the first time myself oh, over here, brother. I've done sessions on this, so I know you've been busy, but here. But now you want me to give you more connection that this king, this king, cannot be David or Solomon or a mere human king. Absolutely. Let's finish because we're gonna do. We'll, we'll do this part one. So, what do we establish? He's Adonai, right? Correct. Use only one at a time of Yahweh. Which is why she's to worship him. Now the queen, you see why? Because he's your God. He's your Adonai. Mm. And he's Elohim, right? Amen. And he rules forever? Forever. And then on top of it, it says, Thy throne, O God, Elohim is forever and ever. He will be praised forever and ever. And that phrase is used for Yahweh in the Psalms. Yahweh is the one who's praised forever and ever. But now let's go a little deeper. The Greek has it this way. Thy throne, O God, O Theos, Psalm 44, 7, 12. So verse 7 and 12 in the Greek. And then it says, because the king has desired thy beauty, for he is thy Lord, Kyrius Su, the Lord of you, Kyrius Su. All right, but now watch. It says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever, right? Right. But now watch here, Limitations 5, 19. Thou, O Lord, Yahuwah, remainest forever, thy throne... From generation to generation. Virtually the same language. Boom. Same language, right? Yeah. So in Lamentations 519, Yahweh, he reigns forever in his thrones from generation to generation. Psalm 45, 6, God the Father says to the king, your throne, O God, Elohim, is forever and ever. Mm. Right? And remember he's called Mighty One, Gibor. Psalm 45 3. You remember that? Here? Let's go Correct. Back. Right, right. I remember. Yeah. And this is the king, right? Yes. Okay. So here it is. Here it is. Gird thy sword upon thy thigh, O mighty, right? Mighty one. O mighty. Almost the mighty. Gibor, right? Right. And he's Elohim. All right. Elohim Gibor. Psalm 40. This, okay. Well, and he's the king, right? Right. Surprise, David. Isaiah 9, 6 to 7. The king. Who will reign on David's throne, who is born a child, a male child. For unto us a child is born, Yelad Yulad, meaning he will be born of a woman, mm. born a male child who is a son given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, El Gibor, the everlasting father, the Prince of Peace. Amen. So wait, Psalm 45, the king, obviously he's going to be a Davidic king. He is Elohim, he is Gibor, he is Adonai, he is worship, and he'll be praised forever, and he reigns forever. And yet here's a child born who is Il, singular form for God, Gibor, and how long does he reign? The Prince of Peace, the increase of his government, and peace there shall be no end, upon the throne of David, upon his kingdom, to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this, so he reigns forever. Amen. And yet in Isaiah 10, 20 to 21, the words El Gibor, guys, use of the child. Again, if you're missing it, 
Isaiah 9, 6 to 7. Mm -hmm. The child born, meaning he'll be born of a woman, he's called El Gibor. All right. But then you go to Isaiah 10, 20 to 21. The same prophet in the next chapter says that El Gibor is the name of Yahweh, Jehovah. Isaiah 10, 20 to 21. And it shall come to pass in that day that the remnant of Israel and such as are escaped of the house of Jacob shall no more again say upon him that smote them, but shall stay upon the Lord, that's Yahuwah, Holy One of Israel, and truth. The remnant shall return, even the remnant of Jacob, unto the mighty God, El Gibor. Yahweh is the mighty God, El Gibor, in Isaiah 10, 21. The child born is El Gibor, mighty God, in Isaiah 9. What's going on here? And now you guys know how the Old Testament cites it, right? Here it is. Mm -hmm. But now, what about the rabbis? Are you ready? What about the Jews? Did the Jews, did the rabbis interpret Psalm 45 as a psalm of King Messiah? Yep, here it is. This is now the Aramaic paraphrase, the Aramaic translation of the Psalms, right? By Jews. They translated the Hebrew Psalms into Aramaic by Jews for those Jews who could only read and write Aramaic called the Aramaic Tergumim, Tergumim, plural, Tergum, right? And if you want to read it online, here it is. Bam, bada bing. Here it is online. It's in my article. Let's zoom in because you guys think I'm lying. Sam, you're just making up stuff. You're a liar, Sam. You're worse than Muhammad. You lie, Sam. Here it is. Boom. Let me get you the link for it itself right there. Boom, Sam. You're a liar, Sam. You're such a liar, sir. <laughs> you're, just, you're just a tool of Satan, Sam. Though you're a handsome tool, you're still a tool of Satan. <laughs> you get it? Damn, homie. My eyes playing tricks on me. That's right. All right, now for those on Facebook. Hold on. Everyone got it? You got it too? I sent it to you, right? Yes, I got it. I'm going to post it right now. Now, now watch here. I'm going to show it to you. Psalm 45. We're going to go to Psalm 45. Who's it about, sir? Psalm 45, mister. Bada bing, bada boom, mister. Psalm 45. And while you're, while you're going there, for everybody on TikTok that feel like they're missing the verses, you guys, it, this is recorded on my YouTube channel, right? Right. I'm not on YouTube yet. I'm on Rumble, so. Yeah. Okay, now, watch here, mister. I'm saying for people to realize I'm not on YouTube. So if they're looking for my YouTube channel, I'm blocked right now. So you got to go to his YouTube channel because Rumble, you have to have an account. Okay. That's why I mentioned. It. Okay, now, here it is, Psalm 45, verse 3. It says what? Your beauty, O King Messiah, Boom. is greater than the sons of men. The spirit of prophecy has been placed on your lips. Because of this, the Lord has blessed you forever. The Jews say it's about King Messiah. But you want to get blown away? Yeah. You know how it says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever? Mm -hmm. Guess how they interpret it. Don't tell me your throne, O word. No, your throne, O Yahweh. Oh, yeah? Here it is, verse 7. Wow. The throne of your glory, O Lord, lasts forever and ever. They took verse 6, which in their turn 7, to be speaking of Yahweh reigning forever. Here it is, verse 30. O Lord, O God in heaven. See that? You understand? They actually took Psalm 45, 6, where it says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. They identified that as being referring to Yahweh, that is saying, you, Yahweh, reign forever, and directly identifying the king as Yahweh God. My goodness, man. Right there. I didn't make it up. Here it is. I mean, you really have to hate God to be a Unitarian. You have to hate him. So the true God, I mean. And you I'm see the footnote right here? You're seeing it, right? It says, O Lord, O God in heaven. Hmm. Right there. So... This is about Messiah, even according to the Aramaic paraphrase. And here, look what I say. What makes this citation so remarkable is that Psalm 45, 6, which identifies Messiah as the God who reigns forever, is actually applied to Jehovah himself. I.e., include example, the Jewish composer, maybe it was more than one, of the foregoing Targum, Aramaic paraphrase of the Bible, took the Psalms reference to Messiah as God and ascribed it to Jehovah himself. Hmm. Okay, but hold on. Is this the only source? Okay, well, what's this source right here? You ready? Let's see. Well, shocks, Dennis. Dennis, shocks. We're almost done, shocks. We're going to go down so you can see what I'm quoting here. Mister, 
It's a long one, but it's worth it. I'm going to wrap it up. Where are you quoting, Sam? Sam, what the hell are you quoting? Sam, I think you're a liar. Well, I got to quote this, man. Hold on. <laughs> this is Tahilim, Tahalim, Tahalim. I say Tana, but it's Tahalim. Psalms, translation and commentary by Rabbi Avraham Chaim Fuer. Fuer. Mezora Publications. Volume 2, Psalm 45, pages 562, 575. This is a commentary and a translation of Tehillim. That's the Hebrew for Psalms. Tehillim, but it's Tehillim. Who translated it? Rabbi Avraham Chaim Fuer. Brooklyn, 1978, Masora Publications, Volume 2, pages 562, 575. Well, shucks, what's going on here, sir? Now, let's go back up. Let's see. What does he say? Who's this about? This is Psalm 45, guys. Psalm 45. Jewish translation. Who is it about, mister? Let's go up. It's a long one. I don't know if I can quote all of it. Here you go. Let's start at the top. My works befit the king. This song befits the king, Messiah. And he tells you which rabbi, Radak. But now, guys, notice the cross references. This is a rabbinic commentary translation. Okay. And notice they're going to quote other Old Testament passages that they believe is about Messiah and tie it in with Psalm, like the New Testament does. Quote several verses, different writers, combine them together because it refers to the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so here it says the song is about King Messiah, right? Right. But now I'm not sure. This refers to the all-inclusive excellence of the Messiah of whom the prophet says, now he quotes Isaiah 52, 13 about the Messiah. Behold, my servant shall be enlightened. He shall be exalted, lifted up, and he shall be very high. Ibn Yahya. That's another rabbi. Accordingly, God has blessed you for eternity. The king of the Messiah shall endure forever. Mayri. You guys seeing that? <laughs> the rabbis are combining Psalm 45 with Isaiah 52, 13, saying it's about King Messiah. Again, gird your sword upon your thigh, Almighty One, your majesty and your splendor. In consonance with this opinion, that this psalm describes the Messiah, Radak understands the sword as a regal weapon, so that he's going to come and kill Gog and Magog. Right? Anyway. Any other references? Let's look. All right. So here, verses 4. Radak understands verse 4 and 5 to mean, After you, Messiah, achieve your splendid triumph over the enemies, as described in the preceding verse. Right? And then he goes on to say, I'm not reading all of it. Because I want to show you the cross references, what they're tying in with Psalm 45, right? This is also a distinctive feature of the Messiah, as Scripture says, and the spirit of wisdom and understanding, spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge, and he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, nor decide after the hearing of his ears. Wow! So you mean the rabbis also said Isaiah 11 with Isaiah 52, 13, and Psalm 45 is all about King Messiah? True faith and sincere belief in Hashem are hallmarks of the Messiah. As Isaiah 11.5 says, And righteous shall be the girdle of his loins, and faith the girdle of his body. Ibn Yahya, Nora Tehilos, right? And the Targum, now he's quoting, there may paraphrase of Isaiah 11, interprets Messiah will ride on a unique royal steed, and right in humility, this alludes to the excellent characteristics of Messiah, Isaiah 11.4. So they quote Isaiah 11, verses 1 to 10, about Messiah. Isaiah 52, verses 13 onward, about Messiah. Psalm 45, about Messiah. And then look, Rashi, another renowned medieval rabbi. According to Rashi, the Messiah will be able to de detect a person's innocence <clears throat> or guilt merely by observing his face. Hey, uh, there. This is the message of our verse. You, Messiah, <clears throat> personally love righteousness and have hated wickedness oh so psalm 45 6 7 is about messiah hear o maiden see and incline your ear forget your people in your father's house matzut matzudas david interprets this entire verse in reference to the messiah really i will commemorate your name through all generations therefore the nations will acknowledge you forever and ever rashi maintains that the psalm is referring to god no Radak is the opinion that the verse is speaking of Messiah. 
Oh. Radak concludes that since Israel yearned for Messiah in every generation, therefore all nations will eventually acknowledge his universal absolute sovereignty. Damn, man. Hmm. Oh, mister. Man, bro. I can give you more, but on and on it goes. And I quote liberal critical scholars, John J. Collins and Bart Ehrman, admitting that Psalm 45 depicts the human ruler as divine, as God, albeit subject to the one true God. I even quote Bart Ehrman in his book, How Jesus Became God, and John J. Collins, but no need to quote it. They both admit as liberals, yes, Psalm 45 describes the king as divine, as being a God, but not on the same level as Yahweh. That's their opinion, but at least they're acknowledging, yeah, the psalm is about a human figure who is identified as being divine, a God. It's all in the article, guys. Amen. Now, with that said, look what he says here. Let me just quote one part of Herman, right? Are you here? Look. Oh, yeah, yeah. Look what he says Oops. about Psalm 110. Psalm 110. Look what he says here. Look, you're here? Yes. This is Bart Ehrman, guys. He's commenting in Psalm 45, Psalm 110. Any being enthroned with God is sharing the glory, status, and honor due to God himself. So he's admitting Psalm 110 is saying David's Lord will share the glory, status, and honor due to, due to God himself. There's not a question of identity, meaning that the king is the same as Yahweh with whom he's enthroned. That's what we believe. They're distinct persons. Or absolute parity. That they're fully equal. That's not what Psalm 110 is suggesting. That's according to Ehrman. The king sitting at God's right hand is not God Almighty himself. That is clear from what is said next. God will conquer the king's enemies for him and put them under his feet. But now notice the admission. But he is doing so for one whom he has exalted up to the level of his own throne. The king is being portrayed as a divine being. This is Bart Ehrman, folks, who lives in the presence of God above all other creatures. Damn, that's Bart Ehrman, dude. <laughs> but now watch what he says about Psalm 45. This is in how Jesus became God. Bart Ehrman, dude, even more stark is Psalm 45, 6 to 7. So let's go here. It is clear that the person addressed as, O oh God, is not God Almighty, but the King, because of what is said later. God Almighty is the King's own God and has anointed him with oil, the standard act of the King's coronation ceremony in ancient Israel. And so God has both anointed and exalted the king above all others, even to a level of deity. The king is in some sense God. Not equal with God Almighty, because he says, you're God. So this is his understanding. But he is deity, and in some sense God. But Ber Ehrman is wrong. He is not, in some sense God, he is God in absolute sense, Distinct from God and subject to him because he's also a man. And I proved that because he's called Adonai. That's right. So there you go. And this is Ehrman. And where? Where? Ehrman, how Jesus became God, the exaltation of a Jewish preacher from Galilee, pages 77, 78. There you go. So to sum up, and we'll wrap it up, and I'll take questions on this if they have, on this. One, the Messiah is identified as Adonai. Two, the Messiah is called Elohim. Three, the Messiah is described as El Gibor, the mighty God. Four, the Messiah's reign is eternal. Five, the Messiah is worshipped and praised by all peoples forever and ever. There you go. We're done. Beautiful, brother. That's Psalm 45. Now, Lord willing, if you want to come back sometime this week, we can do Psalm 110 next, and then we'll conclude with Psalm 2. Beautiful. Uh, if not tomorrow, maybe Thursday, if you're available. Yes, Lord willing. I will be. God I think. Me. I think tomorrow, uh, you know, I'll, I'll be. But just to clarify, yeah, let me, yeah, definitely Thursday, Lord willing, I'll be free. So tomorrow, you let me know. But we're done, guys. Any questions on the topic? I'll take a few. If you have a few, it's got to be on the topic. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> no. All right. None? Well, none whatsoever. Okay. No questions. That's it, guys. You got the materials. If not tomorrow, Lord willing, Lord willing, Thursday. I mean, there are you. there. I mean, I don't know if there are questions. So I, I don't want to. I, I mean, wanna... not coming to the mic. Type them out, dude. We're not going to chance it. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> no, we're not talking coming to you. TikTok. No. Text your question. Uh, 
That's what I'm saying. You you can't trust it because then it start cussing out. No, exactly. And I don't want to ruin it because, brother, this was a blessed session, and we just we thank you, Lord Jesus, for being every awesome. part of this session because <clears throat> th this session was just made alive through your servant by the Holy Spirit. We love you so much. We thank you for every opportunity that we have to further get to know who you are so that we fall all the more in love with you, the beloved of the Father. And because of you, the beloved of the Father, we are now the beloved. Thank you for your prayer for us in John 17, 23. Lord, the Father, the Spirit. Folks, so don't forget, this was also used to prove the beginning of the Son in Psalm 45, oh. verse 23. I, I, I yeah I had a question actually for you in the, uh, earlier and <clears throat> it just came back to mind speaking of the beloved Sam yes. just out of curiosity in Isaiah chapter five the first several verses is that the father speaking of the son when he calls him the beloved who has that vineyard no Isaiah five it's Isaiah talking to God saying that God is his beloved okay I got gotcha. you yeah but. If Isaiah is the mouthpiece, see, this is how it gets tricky. Isaiah 5, 1 to 7. The beloved is Yahweh, and his vineyard is Israel, right? Right. But can it be, is it Isaiah speaking, or is it the Holy Spirit speaking through Isaiah and referring to God as his beloved? See how it works? Because who yeah. inspires the prophets? Exactly, the Holy Spirit. We, and we, we know that Jesus speaks through Isaiah in Isaiah 8, verse He does, 7. but the Father does as well, because... In Isaiah, you have the son who speaks, but then you have the father speaking in Isaiah 42. He says, this is my servant whom my soul delights in. So that's the father speaking, right? That's right. But then in Isaiah 49, it's the son speaking as a servant. Yeah. So you have the Trinity speaking. But my, my question is that in that context is Isaiah referring to God as his beloved. But does that mean that you can say, well, since Isaiah is a mouthpiece, and he does love God. It's God is his beloved. We love God. In one sense, it is one member of the Godhead speaking to the other. Yes. So you can either say it's the Spirit speaking through Isaiah and addressing the Father as his beloved, or it can be the Father speaking through Isaiah, referring to the Son as his beloved, because it's very hard to determine in Isaiah 5 if their Yahweh is a reference to the Trinity, to the Father, or to the Son. Because don't forget, in the parable given by Jesus, the owner is God the Father, and the Son is the heir. Right. Right? Right. So in a sense, the Son owns it. But in that parable, he likens himself to the Son of the owner and the heir. So yeah, the owner is God the Father, and it's his vineyard. But because the Son is the heir, he owns it too. So that's where it gets tricky. Mm. You know, it gets tricky. So is it <laughs> Yahweh the Father that Isaiah is calling my beloved? But even then, that would be the Spirit speaking through him. So you can say, in a sense, the Spirit is saying, my beloved, the one I love because I love and adore the Father. It's it's tricky. It is, obviously, Isaiah speaking, but Isaiah is always a mouthpiece. Right. Amen. We, we will di differentiate when Isaiah is speaking of himself as opposed to the Spirit speaking through Isaiah, Isaiah's mouth. Like when he says, woe is me. I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the king, Yahweh Vos. Well, there, that's Isaiah speaking mm -hmm. of his own unworthiness. But then when he's being used as God's mouthpiece, then it's no longer Isaiah. It's that person coming to the forefront speaking through Isaiah. So at times will be the father. Isaiah 42, that's the father. At times will be the son. In Isaiah chapter 49, chapter 50, right? At times, it's a spirit. How do I know it's a spirit? Because in Isaiah 6, the next chapter, even though John 12, 37 to 42, specifically John 12, 38 to 41, says that the glory that Isaiah saw was the glory of Christ in his pre-human existence, so that Yahweh that he saw in visible shape, seated visibly on a visible throne, John says that was Jesus in his pre-human existence, Paul tells us in Acts 28, 25, 27, that's the spirit who spoke through Isaiah, telling Isaiah to utter the words of Isaiah 6, 9 to 10. Amen. Right? That's right. So who's speaking? Well, in Isaiah 6, 8, it says, I heard the voice of Adonai say, 
whom shall I send who will go for us? So they're there, us. And it's the voice speaking. Well, the voice is the word. So that's Jesus now saying, whom shall I send for us? Who's us? I, Father, and Spirit together. So we know the Son is speaking and appearing. But then when the Son tells Isaiah what to say, that's when the Spirit comes forward to enable Isaiah to understand the words and speak them. Amen. Right? So it's very complex. So you can say one of the divine persons is speaking through Isaiah, calling the other divine person his beloved in Isaiah 5. That you can say. And one more, one more question, if you don't mind. Isaiah chapter 8, 5 through 8, it yeah. says, Yahweh spoke to me further, saying, then he speaks about the king of Assyria, and then in verse 8, Yahweh speaking and says, Then it will sweep onto, into Judah. It will overflow and pass through. It will reach even to the neck. And the spread of its wings will fill the breath of your land, O Emmanuel. Yeah, yeah Is, there it's now speaking of Messiah. But here's where you're going to know amazing. Jesus ends up speaking there. You know that Jesus ends up speaking there? In Isaiah 8, 17 8. and 18. Yes. So that's Jesus now speaking. In Isaiah 17, 18, because in Hebrews 2, verse 13, we're told that Jesus speaking, here I am, the children that God has given me. Amazing, man. Now, people don't know what you're talking about. So you just confuse people because they don't know what you're referring because you just mentioned Isaiah 8. And it's not just 8, verse 8, it's verse 10. Because there it says, God with us. That's the translation of Emmanuel. The word Emmanuel appears twice in verse 8 and 10 of Isaiah 8. Right. Do you see it? Emmanuel, God with us. Well, Emmanuel means God with us. God with us means Emmanuel. So it's used twice in verse 8 and 10. You want me to read it? Well, yeah. I mean, if you have it there, go ahead. Yeah, I, I do have it up. So Isaiah 8 verse 10 says, Devise counsel, but it will be thwarted. Speak a word, but it will not stand. For God is with us. That's Emmanuel. So it appears twice in the text. What so in the, yeah, that's amazing, man. Okay, but so people don't know what relevance this has to what we're talking about. Here you go, Isaiah 8 10. Emmanuel, here it is. Ki Emmanuel. The word Emmanuel appears twice in verse 8 and verse 10. In verse 8, verse 10. So that was verse 10. You mentioned 8, but you didn't mention verse 10. And so it's saying. This is the land of Emmanuel. Here it is. Emmanuel. Emmanuel. Here they don't translate it. But the other one they did. Why? Because of the preposition key. For Emmanuel. It means for God is with us. Mm -hmm. E. Emmanuel. So this means now you're going to have to explain what Emmanuel means. If you say key Emmanuel and I say for Emmanuel in English doesn't make sense. Right? Right. If I say for Emmanuel... It doesn't make sense. So you have to explain the preposition key, meaning for God is with us. Hmm. But God is with us is the word Emmanuel. So God is with us. And it's the land of Emmanuel. It's his land. That's what it says in verse 8. So it's the land of Emmanuel, right? The wings will fill the breath of your land, Emmanuel. Well, then who is this Emmanuel? And <clears throat> because it said it's his land. Well, whoever this Emmanuel is, in verse 10, he's the God that's with us. So he's the God that's with us, and it's his land. So who's now being called Emmanuel? Not, not a mere creature, because it just told you, Isaiah just said, this land is the land of Emmanuel, and God is with us. So whoever this Emmanuel is, he's the God that's with Isaiah. And it's his land. You know, you know it reminds me of, of this teaching that you did a while back on for us. Uh, what is it? I think, was this 2 Kings 17, 24 to 34, about the Assyrian king and then the God of that land sent lions? Yep, 2 Kings 17, 34, all the way to 39. But yeah, when you're starting at 24, I'm sorry, 24 to 33, yes. The God of the land sent, yep, the God of the land sent lions. Because why? 
the land was being defiled. And the God of that land send lions, beasts. Well, who's the God of that land? Emmanuel. Boom. It's his land. <laughs> Amazing. Why are you laughing, dude? I love it, man. I love it. But this guy is going to get cooked by the grace of God. Um, oh, well, oh, he's okay. But what you're going to have to show, let me just show the translation so people understand. Man, I hope you come. I hope you ask a question. That would be amazing. I know. The questions, they suck, dude, because, you know, you know what I'm saying? It's, you know, it's uh, they get away with murder even when you ask a question because the time limits, they suck, you know? Yeah. That's why these cowards like to hide behind time limits instead of doing interactive discussion because interactive discussion, you know how to then catch them in their words. That's why if you go watch my discussion with Taylor Stewart, he started, hey, Dave, Dave. And he was like, man, yeah, I just ran started whining like a narcissist. Okay, now watch what he was telling you, this guy. He changed it to Isaiah 8. All right, so some people think that the child that was to be born as a sign for the king of Judah took place during that time. But they can't tell you who the child is. It's definitely not Hezekiah. Even the rabbi said it's not Hezekiah. So then they think it's the child that, Isaiah's wife birthed because if you are not aware of it, you guys, Isaiah's wife was a prophetess. And it says he came into his wife and she gave birth, right? Right here, verse 3. Then I drew near to the prophetess and she conceived and bore a son. Then Yahweh said to me, Call his name Mahar Shalal Hashbaz. Shalalal. Well, <laughs> yeah, Shalalal. Now, number one, they obviously don't read. Why? Because the child that she gave birth to is not. Emmanuel, because he's called Mahar Shalel Hashbaz. So if anyone tells you, yeah, it's it's Isaiah's child, whom the prophetess gave birth. No, because Yahweh didn't say call him Emmanuel. And what does Mahar Shalel Hashbaz mean? Shalalalalala. Okay. See, this is why we got to read. I may have to do an intensive, in-depth exegesis, Isaiah 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, show you. It has nothing to do with a child born at that time, because God deferred the promise to the future coming Messiah. When you click on D, the name Mahar Shalal Hashbaz means swift is the spoil, speedy is the plunder. The child is a sign that God is going to destroy Judah. Exactly. But according to Isaiah 7, the child was going to be a promise that God would save Judah. So do you have a contradiction? No, right? No, because absolutely. The king of Judah refused to accept God's sign. So God said, okay, you don't want to depend on me and rely on me, but you want to appear, uh, depend on those Assyrians, meaning someone like Albie and Sam, because <laughs> those are our ancestors, by the way. It's not about our ancestors. Well, guess what? I'm going to give you another sign. Isaiah's child, Mahar Shalal Hashbaz, is a sign. I'm going to have Judah destroyed. That's what he says. Then he always said to me, call his name Mahar Shalal Hashbaz. For before the boy knows how to cry out, my father and my mother, the wealth of Damascus and the spoils of Samaria will be carried before the king of Assyria. But not only Damascus and Samaria will be destroyed, he's going to destroy Judah. How do I know? Again, Yahweh spoke to me further saying, and as much as these people have rejected the dental flowing waters of Shiloh and rejoice in Razin and the son of Ramalia, now therefore behold, the Lord is about to bring on them the mighty and abundant waters of the river. The king of Assyria and all his glory and it will rise up over all the channels and go over all its banks. Then it will sleep, sweep on into Judah. It will overflow and pass through, reach even to the neck. And the spread of its wings will fill the breath of your land, O Emmanuel. I'm going to even have Assyria come and destroy Judah. Right there. Saint, Saint Ignatius of Antioch, if you're not joking, you're going to get muted. What was he saying? No, no, it's not, it's not about that. It's about another brother. Pay attention to what's going on. Okay, but you catch it, guys? Do you see it? Amazing. Uh, Ken Yule, I've done millions of sessions on Isaiah 9-6, and I have an article on it. Okay, but for again... There you go. I'm muted. You get the hell out of here. Okay, now, if you're listening, guys, because he wants to go to Isaiah, let's break it down slowly. Now, watch the shift. Watch the shift right here. This son from the prophetess is a sign. It's a sign that I'm going to destroy Syria, Israel, but I'm going to also have Assyria come and destroy Judah, but not wipe it out completely. So now the sign has changed. See, people don't read context. This is the sad thing about us Christians. Isaiah 7, we get some, oh, it was a sign for the king of Judah. Jesus came. Oh, wow. 
Oh, dear. Oh, yeah, Sam. Oh, help me, Sam. I need your help. No, dummy. Can you keep reading? Can you keep reading? Because then God says, all right, since the king of Judah did not want to rely on me and repent of his alliance with Assyria, I'm going to give you another sign. Sha la 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 right? So then he goes, oops, sorry. Did I just exit again? Because I'm so stupid, dude. Damn, am I stupid. I Again, I accidentally exed out. Can you tell me why I'm stupid as I look? All right, let me go here. Damn, I'm not answering, I'm not answering that. Yeah, you're like, man, if I answer that, then I'm history. That's a double-edged sword. That's like, man, he's going to throw me out. Uh, look at another Muslim. I gotta, let me meet this idiot as well. Yeah, yeah he's actually Aisha of the Shia. All right, now. Let's go back here. Let's go through the prophecy. Ready? You guys okay? We go this real quickly. In a, in a, in a okay. You, you want to do, you want to do this now? Let me finish it because you got guys people waiting now. You All right, you, got it. you started, loser. I know, I know. That's why you need people like me. All right. <clears throat> okay, watch here. So <clears throat> now he says, "All right, now I want to bring judgment." But notice Yahweh speaking, right? Right? Right. But Yahweh says, this land belongs to Emmanuel. Did you catch who's speaking? Yep. Yahweh. But he's referring to someone else as Emmanuel. And he says, it's your land. You got it? You guys are catching something deep going on here. Yahweh says... That this land belongs to Emmanuel. And because it's Emmanuel's land, though he'll bring Assyria to punish Judah, he will not have it wiped out because it belongs to Emmanuel who's going to come. And this is where you have to read then Isaiah 9. Because remember, there are no chapter divisions. And then you're going to be told who Emmanuel is. The child born, who's the mighty God, who will replace the king of Judah because he will sit on David's throne. That's how you're supposed to read Isaiah 7. You go to 8, then you go to 9, you go to 10, and then it culminates with a verse 11, mm -hmm. the root of Jesse. Okay, now, watch here. So, Yahweh speaking, right? Right. Okay, let's see what happens. Let's keep going. Be broken, O peoples, and be shattered, and give ear all remote places of the earth. Gird yourselves, yet to be shattered. Gird yourselves, yet be shattered. Devise counsel, but it will be thwarted. Speak a word, but it will not send, for God is with us. So, God is with us. He's not going to, and in this judgment, he's not going to wipe us out completely. But now you're going to tie it in with Jesus. I got to do this now because you mentioned this. Okay. For thus says, for thus Yahweh spoke to me with a strong hand and disciplined me not to walk in the way of this people saying, what people Judah, right? Right. Okay. You are not to say it is a conspiracy in regard to all that this people call a conspiracy. And you are not to fear what they fear and you should not tremble. It's not about Judah because Isaiah is talking to the king of Judah and the house of David. So he's talking about those people. It is Yahweh host whom you should regard as holy. And he shall be your fear. And he shall be your cause of trembling. Then he shall become a sanctuary. But to both the houses of Israel, a stone to strike and a rock to stumble over. And a snare and a trap for the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Now, Yahweh speaking, huh? That's right. Pay attention. So Yahweh is telling Isaiah whom he's supposed to fear. It is Yahweh of hosts whom you should fear. So now he's speaking of Yahweh in the third person, right? And he, this is God speaking, and he shall be your fear. So Yahweh is saying, he, Yahweh, will be your fear, right? Right. And he, Yahweh, and this is Yahweh speaking, right? <laughs> yes. And then he shall become a sanctuary. So Yahweh is saying, you must fear Yahweh of hosts. <laughs> Yahweh is saying, fear Yahweh of hosts. And Yahweh shall be your fear, and Yahweh shall be your cause of trembling. Then Yahweh shall become a sanctuary. But to both the houses of Israel, a stone to strike, and a rock to stumble over, and a snare and a trap to have in Jerusalem. So now he's talking about judgment on both Judah and Israel. Mm. Jer Jerusalem is the capital of Judah. Israel is the northern kingdom. Now he's talking about both of them. But who's going to be a stone, right? Yahweh. And a rock that they'll stumble over? Yahweh, Yahweh right? 
Correct. You guys are catching it? Yahweh, right? Right. Watch how deep this is going to get. Because mm -hmm. got to finish it. No, you brought it up. Mm -hmm. Yahweh, not a creature. La, la, la. Yep, no creature. And a snare and a trap from the heavens of Jerusalem. Many will stumble over them. Then they will fall and be broken. They will even be snared and caught. All right. So Yahweh says, this Yahweh of hosts, whom you're supposed to fear and regard as holy, who will be your sanctuary, Judah and Israel will stumble over and a stone that they will strike against, but they'll be broken, shattered, because you can't destroy this rock. Now watch who this is. Okay, who is that? Watch here. You don't need to guess. Okay, watch here, guys, because this guy brought it up. He's too curious. Curiosity killed the cat, but, you know, what are you going to do with this dude? Watch here. Who is it? Two, three, all the way to eight. Yahweh is talking about Jesus. Mm -hmm. Have you not even read? This is Jesus speaking. Have you not even read this scripture? The stone which the builders rejected, that has become the chief cornerstone. This came about from the Lord and is marvelous in our eyes. So Jesus is quoting this passage about himself. I'm the stone you rejected, Jerusalem. But wait, Acts 4.11, Peter. He is the stone. Jesus is a stone which was rejected by you, the builders, but which became the chief cornerstone. All right, but wait, Isaiah, First uh, Peter 2, 3 to 8 is going to quote Isaiah chapter 8, 12. I'm sorry, Isaiah chapter 8, verse 14, Isaiah 28, 16, and Psalm 118, and applied to Christ. Watch. Mm -hmm. If you have tasted the kindness of the Lord and coming to him as a living stone, which has been rejected by men, that's Jesus, but is a choice and precious in the sight of God. So him has to be Jesus. Who is he? A living stone, precious inside of God. You also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For this is contained in Scripture. Here, Jesus is mentioned in Scripture. Who is he? Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, and he who believes in upon him will not be put to shame. This precious value, then, is for you who believe. But for those who disbelieve, the stone which the builders rejected, this became the chief cornerstone, and bam, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Mm -hmm. They stumble because they're disobedient to the word, and to this stumbling they were also appointed. So here he quotes passages. He quoted here Isaiah 28, 16. Mm -hmm. He quoted Isaiah 8, 14, as well as Psalm 118. Isaiah 8, 14, here. This here, right here, First Peter two eight, right? Mm -hmm. This is Isaiah eight fourteen. Let's go back. Okay. All right. A stone to strike and a rock stumbling over. Did you guys catch it? He's quoting the Greek version of Isaiah eight fourteen. But according to, according to, Peter, that stone is Jesus. But according to Yahweh. Who's speaking? That stone is Yahweh of hosts. He Amen. just identified the Messiah as Emmanuel, Yahweh of hosts. Okay, now we got that over with, right? Mm -hmm. Let me make this final point because you brought it up. Because we're going to read now 16, 18. Bind up the testimony, seal the long among my disciples. And I will wait for Yahweh, who's hiding his face from the house of Jacob. And I will hope for him. I will wait for Yahweh, who is hiding his face from the whole house of Jacob, and I will hope for him. Now, here's where it gets tricky. Behold, I and the children whom Yahweh has given me are for signs and wonders in Israel from Yahweh of hosts who dwells on Mount Zion. Okay, now, when I read it here, I'm going to have to discern who's speaking. By not the testimony seal the law among my disciples. Whose disciples? Is yeah. it Isaiah's disciples or is God still speaking? See, that's tricky, right? Because they ended the quotation here telling you now it's not God speaking. But quotation marks are added. How do you know? How do you know God stopped speaking here? How do you know exactly. God is not saying, bind up the testimony, Isaiah, seal the law among my disciples. See what happens with quotation marks? You're not dependent on the translators, right? You're not dependent on the translator to tell you when God finishes speaking and Isaiah begins. Hmm. Right? Right. 
We're going to have to finish this real quick. So let's tread carefully. Bind up the testimony sealed along among my disciples. Is it Isaiah or God? Well, I would say it's God because God is telling Isaiah, bind up the testimony sealed along among my disciples. But now here's where it gets even more tricky. So does God's words end here? Or does it continue and God is speaking? I'll wait for Yahweh who's hiding his face from the house of Jacob. I'll hope for him. Now, what does it mean that God hopes for him? Is it? I'm not saying. Just think deeply. He's not hoping in the sense like, gee, I'm lost and I need. No, no, no. <laughs> Meaning hope in the sense that he is the one who will come and undo all this and restore. Behold, I and the children whom Yahweh has given me are signs are for signs and wonders Israel from Yahweh of hosts. Now, is this Yahweh still speaking? Or is it not Yahweh, it's Isaiah, who dwells on Mount Zion? Because now, if it's Yahweh still speaking, now we have something interesting. Here we had Yahweh speaking of Yahweh in the third person, but the Yahweh he speaks about is identified of Jesus. But then if it's Yahweh speaking, according to Hebrews, now it's Yahweh the Son speaking. See how complex it gets? What, what do I mean? Because mm -hmm. here, Isaiah 8, 17 to 18, right here, r these two passages are applied to Jesus in Hebrews 2, 13. Mm -hmm. Right here. Where we go? Hebrews 2. We're going to go 12 to 13. Saying, well, let's start so you can know who's saying it. Let's start at 11. So you guys know what it's talking about. For both he, Jesus, who sanctifies, and those who are being sent are all one, for which reason he's not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will recount your name to my brothers. That's Psalm 22, 22. In the midst of the assembly, I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. That's, I will, you know, my hope is in him, right? Right. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. According to Hebrews, Jesus is speaking in Isaiah 8, 17 to 18. Cross-reference here. Let's see. Isaiah 8, 17 to 18. Cited where? Hebrews 2, 13. So, but if I read Isaiah 8, and I don't let the translators tell me when Yahweh's words end, right? Mm -hmm. It's Yahweh speaking. But then, if Yahweh's speaking, we have Yahweh speaking of Yahweh, who will be a stone of stumbling, and that's Jesus. But then all of a sudden, it's now Yahweh and the children that Yahweh gave him that are now trusting in Yahweh to come. Hmm. See how complex it gets? Yeah. So you see? So and either way, according to Hebrews, Isaiah 8, 17, 18 is not Isaiah speaking. It's Jesus speaking. It's Jesus speaking. Mm -hmm. So if it's Jesus speaking, then that means Yahweh is referring to Emmanuel is already there, right? And Yahweh is assuring Emmanuel that his land won't be decimated, wiped out, because this Yahweh, who is Emmanuel, will come and save <clears throat> Jerusalem. So he's assuring him they will not be wiped out completely like Sodom or Gomorrah or when the northern kingdom ceased to be. No, Emmanuel, it's your land. And the people will wait for God who will come to dwell with us because you are the one who will come to restore. And those who reject you, you will be a stone that crushed them. It gets too complicated. You know, you know, you know, I'm itching to ask you uh, another question regarding Zechariah yeah. 3. We should save it for another time. I'll get Zechariah, it. Yeah. Well, Get anyway, it. it's up to you, yeah. We can, but you understand Isaiah 8 needs to be really, really carefully understood and read because it, it seems like you have Yahweh the Father speaking about Yahweh the Son, but then somehow Yahweh the Son now speaks to Yahweh the Father. <laughs> right? Because if you take Isaiah 8, 17, 18, that's not Isaiah speaking. That's Jesus speaking. Exactly. About him coming to redeem those of the seed of Abraham who believe in him and will not be destroyed because they stumbled over him. See? It's very complicated. Mm -hmm. 
Maybe. But obviously, if you're a liberal or if you're a modern critical scholar who doesn't want to read too much Trinity in the Old Testament and believe that distinct persons of the Godhead can speak to one another and about the other, then this is all nonsense to you. But I don't care what modern scholars have to say. I'm going by what the New Testament says, who's speaking. In Isaiah 8, 17, 18, they told me that Jesus speaking. It's not Isaiah. Well, you say, well, Isaiah is foreshadowing Jesus. Maybe, but maybe not. Because in Isaiah 8, verse 14, that stone is said to be Jesus in 1 Peter 2, verse 8. Yeah. But that stone is said to be Yahweh himself, right? For Yahweh spoke to me, and he said to him, what? It is Yahweh of hosts whom you shall regard as holy. He shall you fear. And it's Yahweh who is, what? The stone and a rock that you stumble over. But in 1 Peter 2, 8, here, we're told that's Jesus. Amen. I, Yahweh said that's Yahweh. So is Yahweh speaking of himself in the third person? All right. Then that's the son speaking of himself in the third person. Or is it Yahweh the Father speaking about Yahweh the Son? Okay. Because if you now say that it's Yahweh speaking of himself in the third person, that the Yahweh you fear is me speaking, then now you have Jesus speaking throughout as Yahweh and not Yahweh the Father speaking about Yahweh the Son and then Yahweh the Son speaking about the Father. You see how complex it gets? Yeah, I would take it as the Father speaking about the Son, and then Peter highlights that even in First Peter three fifteen. Yeah, but no, that's a variant reading. See, then yeah, you lose if you use it. That's why I didn't use it. You see, I never went there. Yeah, I noticed that. That's why I didn't go there. But you want to make it harder for yourself than get into textual critical issues? That's up to you. That's true. But then, if it's Yahweh the Father speaking about Yahweh the Son, then here there is no indication that Yahweh has stopped speaking. So if it's now Yahweh speaking all the way here, then Isaiah 8, 17, 18, we're told that's not Isaiah, that's Jesus speaking. So is it now Yahweh, the son who's going to be speaking to the father? So we had the father speaking about Yahweh, the son, and now Yahweh, the son speaking? Or should we say it's Yahweh speaking of himself in the third person? So it's just the same person speaking, which means that it's Yahweh the Son speaking throughout. Mm -hmm. See, that's debatable. But one thing is certain. This Yahweh here in Isaiah 8, 12 to 14, is Jesus, according to 1 Peter 2, verses 3 to 8. And this person here, Isaiah 8, 7, 18, who's speaking, I will hope for him. I will trust in him. Behold, I and the children of Yahweh has given me. Hebrews 2.13 says that's Jesus. So this entire section here is Yahweh speaking, and included in that is Jesus speaking. It's not Isaiah speaking. You with me there? With you. Isaiah does not speak at all if you believe the New Testament. It's Yahweh speaking because here Isaiah 8, 1718 is attributed to Jesus. Exactly. Right? You get my point? Absolutely. Now, even if I go on, let's go a little more. I'm going to make it real quick. Yeah, yeah, yeah Sam, get it. Okay, then well, it's your problem, dude. Jen, you should have done it 30 minutes ago. Now, ask me. <laughs> Stinking loser. All right. Anyway, we're out of here. You are a loser, dude. All right. You got it now? But, so we're done. But, you spark, go. go. but, you, but you spark curiosity, though. Yeah, well, because that means we have to now read much more deeper, much more clearly, much more carefully to assume either it's now two persons speaking, Yahweh the Father about Yahweh the Son, and then Yahweh the Son speaks about Yahweh the Father here. Or it's one person speaking, Yahweh, about himself in the third person, and that Yahweh is still Yahweh the Son. Either way, you have Jesus in here. Amen. Right? Which but means this is this section. Let me, before you go, what section? This section here, right? Mm -hmm. But earlier here, you can say that Yahweh, who spoke here, verse 5, is now speaking to Emmanuel. Your land, O Emmanuel, right? In verse 8, right? 
Right. And since it's Yahweh still speaking, he says, for God is with us. Meaning this Emmanuel is for us. He's for me because he's fulfilling my will. And part of my will is that it'll be for you to save you. For God is with us. He doesn't oppose me. He's for me. He comes to accomplish my will. And my will includes that he comes for you to save you if you believe. Very complex. But anyway. There you go. All right. Huh. Yeah, you got to go do what you got to do. You're still delaying it. Go, Nasha. Go. Come on. All right. Yeah, I was just thought uh, when I was reading Isaiah 8, verse 5, it says, The Lord also spoke to me again, saying. So then I was thinking, right? Yeah, was spoke to me further, you? saying. Because yeah. he spoke to me here in verse 1. Right. Ex exactly. That's what I was looking at. And we have verse, yeah, verse 1 and verse 3, right? But. The Yahweh spoke to me further, saying, so now he's telling Isaiah what's going to happen. That's what he's telling you. Yahweh spoke to me further, saying, so he's telling me to say this, what's going to happen. And then again, he says, for thus Yahweh spoke to me. So here we know it's now Isaiah relaying the words of Yahweh. But when Yahweh speaks, he speaks of Yahweh as the stone. That's my point. Mm. We know it's not Yahweh speaking to the other divine person because here it says, Then I drew near to the prophetess, and she conceived and bore a son. Then Yahweh said to me, Call his name. Right, right. Now that was how we know it's God speaking to Isaiah. But when God speaks to Isaiah, he speaks about Yahweh. Mm. Right? And then yeah. he addresses Emmanuel here. Now, Yahweh is speaking to Emmanuel. Fill the breath of your land, O Emmanuel. That's what they're going to do. The Assyrians are going to come and fill the breath of your land, O Emmanuel. So now God is speaking to Emmanuel. It's not Isaiah. So Isaiah is recording a heavenly conversation, much like Mark 1, 2, right? Yep, Mark 1, 2, yeah. And also in Isaiah 42, when it says, Behold my servant. Right. right. There now God is talking to Isaiah about a servant. And in Isaiah 49, you have the servant speaking, and he mentions what God told him. Right in Isaiah 49, 4 to 6. The servant is speaking, and then he tells him what God tells me here. For a guy who's got to go, you're still like, man, hold on. Well, I mean, this Bible is amazing, brother. I know it is, but here, let me show you what I mean. Here, the servant speaking, that's Jesus. Listen to me, O coastlands, and pay attention, you peoples from afar. Yahweh called me from my womb. From the body of my mother, he made me my name to be. So the, the servant who's going to be born of a woman is talking. But he's talking 700 years before he's born. He has set my mouth like a sharp sword, right? He has set my mouth like in the shadow of his hand. He has concealed me, and he has also set me as a select arrow. He has hidden me in his quiver. He said to me, you are my servant Israel. So he's now telling you what God said to him, right? And whom I will show forth my beautiful glory. But I said, now he's telling you what he said to God. I've toiled in vain. I've spent my might for nothing in vanity. Yet surely the justice due to me is with Yahweh, and my reward is with my God. So now... Says Yahweh, who formed me from them to be a servant. So he's going to tell you what Yahweh said to me, the servant, to turn Jacob back to him, so that Israel might be gathered to him. For I'm glorified in the sight of Yahweh, and my God is my strength. He says, It is too small a thing that you should be my servant. So here you have a conversation where the servant's telling you what God told me. Mm -hmm. What God said to me, and what I said to him. <laughs> exactly. And we know that's Jesus. He's called Israel, saves Israel. Amen. So there you go. Anyway, you got to go going, mister. Amen. God bless you, Sam. God bless you. God bless your daughters. God bless the loved ones in your life you. and that special young lady as well. Amen. God bless all your desires and bring it to pass. So, Lord willing, I'll see you maybe tomorrow or we'll see you Thursday.